In this video, we're going to take a look at Sony's A7S III. Now, this camera, of course, has been all over the internet and on YouTube. And uh, I'm really curious, you know, when it comes to video, again, I don't get into any of the uh, still photo capabilities, but when it comes to video, I am really curious how well does this camera work and how well or how easy will it be to integrate into my workflow for production work. So let's just jump right in and get to a couple of tests. Let's look at autofocus first. Now, once the camera actually locks onto my face, it does a pretty good job of uh, tracking with me. You know, it has the, uh, the tracking eye detection and um, it's pretty, pretty sticky. You know, we're at 50 millimeters F2, uh, autofocus speed of five, sensitivity of five. And as you can see, uh, it stayed with me on that walk up. Now, um, when I go off, it doesn't drop me right away, picks me up again, uh, a little bit of hunting there. But then again, it just, uh, it, you know, stays with me all the way up to uh, close focus. With this test, I'm trying to get a feel of uh, what uh, focus pulls will feel like at different speeds uh, with this camera, going again from close focus to uh, infinity. And now we're slowing it down to uh, speed four, about the middle of the speed setting. And now we're slowing it down all the way to the number one, uh, the slowest autofocus speed setting. And uh, here you can actually kind of tell how how the Sony um, added, added has ramps uh, as it comes to uh, its final position. Now we did see this ramping uh, in speed four. A little bobble there. And a slow pull to, uh, to the distance. So the autofocus on Sony's a7S III it seems to really work. Um, now we'll only know after, you know, months and months of use using autofocus day in, day out on regular pay jobs, if in fact it is professional ready, but it feels like Sony really is turning the page and their autofocus is really ready to go with uh, professional video work. Now, um, in my test, I did come up with, a, well, there were a couple of caveats, but one of them, which was fairly major for me was this, and that is, uh, the Metabones uh, at Smart Adapters. This is the uh, EF to uh, E mount adapter. It's not the Speed Booster. It is the Mark IV. Now I did upgrade to the latest firmware, which I think was build 67. And uh, even when I go into advanced mode on this adapter, uh, most of my Canon EF autofocus lenses uh, did not work, did not work reliably. Um, most of the time it, it could not even find focus at all. Sometimes every now and then it would it would it would hit focus and then it would just lose it, but certainly cannot track. Um, so I would say at this point, uh, for me anyway, the EF autofocus lenses uh, did not work with the Metabones adapter. Now in time, um, I have a feeling Metabones you know may come up with a firmware update where in video mode or in movie mode, uh, their adapters will work for autofocus. But that time isn't today, and. Uh, this experience did help me really push forward the uh, decision to try to move over to all native E-mount lenses if I'm going to use an autofocus lens. Um, so that's a whole nother process and probably a whole couple of videos just on that process. Uh, the Metabones adapter will be fine with manual focus lenses, but with uh, autofocus, I did decide to go with all E-mount lenses. Sony has done an excellent job of maintaining the field of view on the a7S III. Now, as we cycle through the different codecs and different frame rates, the field of view doesn't change until we hit 120 frames per second and we have a very slight punch in. Now, the exception is in HD, we come back out to a full field of view. Now, another change in field of view happens when we use steady shot. So here's steady shot in normal and now active. And so there is a punch in. And of course, you know, when we're at 120 frames per second, uh, steady shot active mode is not available to us. This is my somewhat unscientific uh, rolling shutter test. The camera is uh, 10 feet away from the windows and I just pan back and forth, both in Ultra HD and HD. And as you can see, um, the rolling shutter control is, is very good with this camera as reported by many other people. So big improvement on rolling shutter. For this shot, I am simply uh, holding the camera in my hands and uh, walking down the patio. Now you could see the, the shakes, you know, the high frequency shakes that's typical of a very light camera. 
Now, once I land, you know, it's, it's much easier to hold the camera still. This is our baseline. Now I have steady shot standard activated. And as you can see, it definitely takes out those high frequency shakes, uh, but still the camera does move around quite a bit. Now, when I stop and hold on this tree, this is where, you know, these small cameras, you know, IBIS really comes into play. And now we have active steady shot in play. And as you can see, it does a very good job of smoothing out uh, the walk. And once we get to the tree, it holds it very nice and steady. I'm set up to record sound, and this is the setup that I would typically use to record sound, especially in something like an interview. We have up here our hypercardioid microphone going to a recorder, a mixer recorder, in this case, a Sound Devices Mix Pre 6 2. And from here, we have a signal out going into camera, into the mic uh, input in, and uh, all three devices are currently recording. That is, of course, you know, my uh, YouTube camera. And as before, I'll read a, uh, the opening paragraph from uh, Patrick Rothfuss in the name of the wind. Mostly for consistency. I know if you watch my other tests, you're probably getting tired of this, but it's uh, something that's easy for me to do, basically. It was night again. The Waystone Inn lay in silence, and it was a silence of three parts. It was night again. The Waystone Inn lay in silence, and it was a silence of three parts. The most obvious part was a hollow, echoing quiet made by things that were lacking. The most obvious part was a hollow, echoing quiet made by things that were lacking. If there had been a wind, it would have sighed through the trees, set the inn sign creaking on its hooks, and brushed the silence down the road like a trailing autumn leaves. If there had been a wind, it would have sighed through the trees, set the inn sign creaking on its hooks, and brushed the silence down the road like a trailing autumn leaves. Now in the edit system, I just listened to the audio, and that's the bit recorded on the uh, recorder, the sound devices, and the audio recorded that was fed to the camera. And uh, I have to admit, you know, just using listening to the files directly with uh, studio headphones, there's not a big difference in the sound of the the audio and the quality of the audio between the audio recorded in camera or on the sound devices. Now on YouTube, you know, with all the compression going on, I'm not sure how much of a difference you'll be able to hear, but for myself, um, I was actually impressed with the audio quality uh, when recorded to camera. Now for me, this opens up, you know, a lot of possibilities if I'm looking for a really small footprint with audio. For example, Sony has this accessory, you know, when mated with their digital wireless receiver, take away the batteries and you take away the cables. It just it plugs right into the camera and, you know, the camera powers the unit and no wires are involved. I mean, that's great. Look how small it is. And again, no wires, no hassles. Um, this is really interesting. Now, of course, they have this other audio adapter, uh, much larger, um, but again, it does have a couple of XLR inputs. That's another possibility. But again, this is a much larger, bulkier solution. It does give the potential. I think the audio recorded in camera directly does give the potential of a very, very small footprint. Um, and that's great. It's just another option. So that's my basic audio test with the A7S III. Um, definitely have options with audio because it is excellent in camera, at least the way that I would use it. And that's going to take us to uh, the next point, And that is if I am going to use that self-powered uh, adapter on top, uh, it's battery life. So let's take a look at battery life now. And now for my uh, super creative shot, filming a clock. As you can see from the subtitle that we went uh, 102 minutes. Uh, with a brand new battery at full charge before the camera shut off. And I'm also happy to say that the camera did close out the file before it shut down. I do want to mention I will go into uh, alternate power setups in a much greater detail in a future video. So that's going to wrap up our initial look at Sony's A7S III for video production. Now one question you may have is, is this camera all that? And the short answer is, Yes. Now, a slightly longer answer is, uh, for myself, I think the A7S III is the, the first mirrorless or small DSLR camera that um, just felt like a natural extension of uh, my production workflow. Uh, in other words, it's, it's logical, it's easy to use, and it has the uh, image quality and the codecs that we more or less expect, or at least the color space that we expect and want to work with, namely 10-bit 422 color in Ultra HD or HD even up to 120 frames per second, which, um, which is great, of course. Now, in this video, we did not get into image quality at all uh, for a couple of reasons. One, 
it, it's a whole subject onto its own and that would just take a ton of time and, and a lot of tests to work through. Uh, for another reason I didn't get into it is that basically all the modern cameras now, whether it's a mirrorless camera, cinema camera, you know, in terms of image quality, they're all great. You have to understand that. Like basically all the cameras that they sell now, APS-C and larger, Super 35 and larger sensor size, um, and even uh, Micro Four Thirds, I think they're great. It's not about the camera not giving you a great image anymore. It's really about um, what you do with the camera, how you light, how you compose. Uh, that's what generates the image and that's what we get paid to do. But in terms of hardware, like we just don't have that limitation anymore. Now, some things are easier to use than others and they all have a different look. And of course they all have, they all fulfill different functions and we do have to choose the right tool for the job, but image quality isn't so much of an issue anymore. Now, in the future, of course, I'm gonna be getting into, uh, you know, rigging out the camera. Um, actually, lenses are gonna be the next subject because I have to build a lens set. So uh, choosing lenses and building up a set is gonna be, you know, probably my next subject. At least that's the next thing that I have to do for this camera because I am committed to the full frame format now. And after that, it's, of course, rigging, battery power, working with RAW. This camera is RAW capable, as all of you know, working with like a Shogun 7 or a Ninja 5. So we'll be getting into that, the RAW workflow and the image quality going to RAW, you know, instead of uh, one of the native codecs. And that's gonna wrap it up. I hope this video was helpful. And if it was, please subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one.